Okay, and I don't think I received any, so uh, we'll see what transpires. Uh, I, I do know that Mark Sutherland can't make it, the Chief Superintendent Mark can't make it, but Brian is here instead, so uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, any uh, sorry, uh, Superintendent McKerns is actually representing Chief Superintendent Sutherland this morning. Uh, I notified Damon late on uh, yesterday, so Mr McKerns is here as well, thanks. Okay, thanks for that, Brian. Uh, okay, any de declarations of interest? <coughs> okay, thank you. So can we then go over to Inspector McCarns for the police report? Yeah, Council American, it's, it's myself. I'll uh, go through the report if that's uh, that's in order. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Okay, thanks very much, uh, uh, very much Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to present the Cabinet with this update on our policing activities in the third quarter of 2020 and to share some of the positive outcomes achieved. As Chief Superintendent Sutherland has referenced in his opening remarks in the report, our performance is largely positive and very welcome, but this has been strongly uh, influenced by the ongoing COVID pandemic. In this reporting period, we saw a return to the most stringent measures uh, experienced earlier in the year, with people's daily lives being very different. This highlighted the COVID pandemic is far from over and added complexity to the challenges faced by officers on a daily basis. We also remain mindful that these uh, restrictions may have resulted in under-reporting uh, by certain victims, in particular in relation to uh, domestic abuse and vulnerable families that may be at risk of harm. And we obviously continue to work with our colleagues in the social work department in relation uh, to adult and child protection. Uh, alongside the reintroduction of restrictions, we also saw uh, an increase in youth disorder in some parts of the local authority. This was particularly evident in the run up to Bonfire Night, where we started to receive calls regarding the use of fireworks. And we also worked closely with our colleagues uh, in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and Trading Standards to target this issue. Uh, we also continued strong partnership working as prepared for what was a very different festive season. In the absence of the traditional party nights, uh, our officers focused on the safe sale of alcohol by off licensed premises and carried out high visibility patrols to make the festive season as possible for people across East Renfrewshire, uh, which uh, was hopefully what everybody was looking to see. So if I could now take members on to the main body of the report, which includes some of the updates and our priorities in our, our local police plan. Uh, so moving on to the first section, which is under public protection, I must start with an apology. There's a, a slight typo. It makes reference to the, the second quarter. We're obviously talking about the third quarter, so that's uh, my apologies in that regard. But in the third quarter, we have continued to see a, a, decrease, a decrease in the reporting of sexual crimes uh, with 84 victims having come forward compared to 112 last year. This reduction is obviously welcome, but uh, as referenced in my opening remarks, we're mindful that the pandemic may have had an influence and prevented some people coming forward uh, to report crime. So we continue to work with our partner agencies to provide support to victims as and when they do come forward to report what are ongoing and some historical incidents. Moving on to a uh, violent crime, uh, as members will see from the, uh, some of the, the, the graphics on the report, serious assaults are up one uh, compared to last year. However, overall claims of violence are down 51 compared to last year's figures. We remain committed to reducing and preventing violent crime and I'm pleased to report to the Cabinet that there has been an overall reduction this year compared to last year. There have been 316 victims compared to 367 last year. There has been a slight increase in serious assaults, which I've already referenced, with 21 reported as opposed to 20 last year, and also a slight increase in number of robberies, with eight reported this year compared to six last year. However, detention rates for both of these crime types remain high, 75% and 71 respectively. The number of common assaults recorded is significantly lower, with 287 crimes having been reported compared to 341 last year. This represents a 16% reduction in the crimes being committed, and the detection rate sits at 60%, which is again up from 55% at the same point last year. Obviously, domestic abuse continues to remain a focus for uh, our officers, and in the third quarter, the number of domestic abuse crimes has reduced from 237 to 217. However, the domestic number of domestic incidents actually attended by the police in East Renfrewshire has remained consistent with 399 uh, last year uh, compared to 397 this year. So that kind of gives an indication to members that we're still going uh, to the same number of domestic incidents, but there is a, a, a slightly less uh, 
conversion rate when it comes to crime. We continue to re receive support from our Specialist Domestic Abuse Investigation Unit in relation to uh, high tariff victims and ensure that all investigative avenues uh, are, are, are followed up in relation to domestic crime. And all of our officers locally have received uh, a briefing in relation to the new Ask for uh, Action Needed uh, Immediately code word scheme. This was introduced to prevent, uh, sorry, provide a discreet way for victims of domestic abuse to signal that they needed emergency help when they were visiting pharmacies. And I think members would agree this is a, a valuable step forward for the victims of domestic abuse. If we could take members on to drug dealing and misuse. Uh, despite the challenges presented by coronavirus, our officers have continued to target individuals who are supplied and the supply of controlled drugs through the execution of search warrants and legislative searches when in patrol. The number of reports submitted to the Procurator Fiscal for person involved in the supply, production and cultivation in, uh, of drugs has reduced slightly compared to last year. It's went down from 20 to 19. However, we continue to seize large amounts of controlled drugs, which have included herbal cannabis, cocaine and heroin. Uh, moving on to acquisitive crime, there have been 17 less victims of domestic housebreaking against last year's figures with 48 crimes being reported as opposed to 65 at the same point last year. This is also significantly lower than the five-year average, where there were 87 victims of domestic housebreaking. This reduction obviously follows the trend that was previously reported to the Cabinet in the first six months of 2020. It may partly be due, uh, due to people spending more time at home. However, we've continued to monitor this type of crime so that any patterns are quickly identified and our officers have continued to carry out high visibility patrols to deter any would-be uh, offenders. Uh, we also still continue to carry out robust inquiries in relation to all, uh, all crimes reported and maintain good forensic awareness, uh, which has resulted in some person-to-scene hits, resulting in some detection several months down the line. Uh, if I could take members on to antisocial behaviour and disorder, uh, as members have been aware from previous Cabinet reports, antisocial anti behaviour calls made to the police are up significantly compared to last year. There have been an extra 967 uh, reports compared to the same period last year. Now, we obviously remain committed to reducing antisocial behaviour, uh, and this uh, increase is obviously something we're keeping a very close eye on. However, as previously reported, a significant number, uh, number of those calls and the increase that I'm reporting today uh, were reported in the first quarter of 2020. But we have continued to see an increase in reporting uh, through 2020. It tailed off in the second quarter, but uh, I have to report to members uh, that that uh, reporting has increased as restrictions have been reintroduced and that the reporting continues to be to be higher than, than what we'd normally experience in East Renfrewshire. I've already touched on the increase that we, we expected and saw uh, in relation to firework calls in relation uh, to the run-up to bonfire night and we worked closely with our colleagues from the, the fire service and the knowledge that people were unable to attend organised displays this year and maybe letting off fireworks in less safe environments. Our officers responded to call uh, calls alongside our colleagues from the fire service and we provided support and advice when necessary. We've also continued to, uh, to deploy officers through uh, the third quarter on our subdivisional action plan uh, which focuses on disorder and that's uh, uh, locations that are identified through our local tasking processes. And these patrols have hopefully contributed to a reduction in the claims of vandalism, uh, which are down from 103 uh, last year to 88 uh, this year. And that's also down against the five-year average of 117 uh, claims. If I could now take members onto page two of uh, the report, which highlights some of the specific activities that our officers have undertaken uh, through the third quarter of 2020, I'm aware that the members have had uh, the opportunity to read the, read the report in advance of today's meeting, and I don't intend to go through every single uh, single example. However, there are certain aspects uh, that I would like to highlight, and as members will note, this uh, section continues to be slight, uh, split into crime and protecting vulnerable people. Uh, uh, so moving on to page two, uh, as I've said, I've highlighted some excellent detection by officers in relation to the crime uh, that's occurred in East Renfrewshire in the third quarter of 2020, and also some of the work that we've carried out in relation to the supply of controlled drugs. However, it's the area of violent crime that I would like to touch on today, if that's OK. In December, an attempt was made to rob a 14-year-old female of her mobile phone in the Giffnock area, 
as members will probably be aware, this attracted a fair amount of media attention uh, in the local uh, press. Our community investigation officers carried out an in-depth investigation, which included a comprehensive CCTV trial and review of other incidents in the surrounding area. Uh, through diligent inquiries, uh, we identified and arrested a 20-year-old male, uh, and he's due to uh, appear at court in February in relation to that crime. And another serious incident, which involved a disturbance in Barhead, uh, a 25-year-old man sustained serious injuries to his legs. Thankfully, these were life-threatening. However, CID officers at Giffnock carried out an investigation and a 25-year-old male uh, was charged with serious assault, possession of a knife and possession of offensive weapon. Uh, I have to update members that in reviewing these incidents initially as area commander, I knew that both inquiries would be difficult to progress and it's only through the perseverance of the officers concerned that I'm able to report a positive outcome to members today. Uh, moving on to protecting vulnerable people, uh, road safety and protecting vulnerable road users continues to be a focus uh, for communities across East Renfrewshire and is highlighted through our, uh, to ourselves through community engagement. In the third quarter, seven drivers have been stopped whilst driving over the prescribed limit for alcohol uh, and reported to the procurator fiscal. And in a couple of quite worrying incidents uh, that I'd highlight to members, in Giffnock during December, a 59-year-old male was uh, stopped whilst driving nearly five times the legal limit for al uh, alcohol, and separately, a 58-year-old was found to be driving nearly six times the legal limit of alcohol. Both individuals have been arrested and reported to the Procurator Fiscal. The final item that I would like to update members on is in relation to a uh, initiative in relation to vulnerable missing people, uh, which comes under the heading of Adult and Child Protection. In September, a uh, Greater Glasgow Division rolled out the Herbert Protocol. Uh, this protocol calls in relation to vulnerable missing people who suffer from dementia eh, and encourages family members and carers of someone who's diagnosed eh, to create and store an information pack which contains vital information in the event that that person is reported missing. This is not intended to re eh, replace existing safeguarding security measures but it gives an additional layer of support and reassurance eh, to people eh, and families eh, that are su eh, suffering from dementia. And the existence of this information can save police critical time in establishing the history of a missing person and a potential location. And I'm happy to update members that this is already born through in East Renfrewshire and was used by officers, officers locally eh, a couple of weeks ago where we did have a report of a person being reported missing who thankfully was traced very quickly. Eh, that concludes my update to the, the Cabinet today. I'd just like re to record my, my thanks to eh, the partner agencies who have worked alongside in the last quarter and indeed in my tenure uh, in East Renfrewshire. I'm certain that this uh, joint approach has uh, benefited communities across the area, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, that uh, members might have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for the report. And I'll speak a little bit about the end about you leaving us, but uh, thanks very much for the report uh, for now. And uh, I can open up to questions if anybody has a question for Brian. I see Councillor Bamforth has her hand up first and then Councillor Grant. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, Brian. And I'm sure we'll all join in, join in as Councillor Merrick um, says uh, at the end. And I'll, although I'm sure your wife will keep you updated on things that are going on in the local area, <laughs> as we know um, about some of the social media um, posts. Um, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to bang on at my usual drum and I'm glad that you're drilling down into the reduction of the reporting of sexual crimes because, you know, I ask you about that each time. I'm, I'm a bit, um, I've got three questions for you. The first one is around the domestic incidents and the domestic abuse and the conversion rate. Um, and I understand what you're saying is with the partner agencies and they're involved. So I'm presuming they're looking into why there is a conversion rate if that's people that are maybe... Um, too afraid to actually proceed any further or, or whether it's not appropriate. Um, the second question I want to ask is, is about, I know, I know this was the third quarter, but East Renfrewshire, as we know, was, was in a pretty severe lockdown even in the third quarter. Um, there can't see anything around uh, any kind of data or numbers on COVID call-outs, you know, to maybe houses or parties or, or whatever. Have you seen, uh, obviously, anecdotally, um, I've heard of, of officers being called out, and I just wondered what what kind of um, level that was at. I know when you're talking about the antisocial behaviour, um, that's increased quite a bit, so I'm assuming that that's possibly residents 
calling about young people hanging about in their parks and in their play areas. So I would, I would expect to see the same possibly or similar pattern in, in households. And the third question I've been asked by another councillor to um, see that is there any um, that there's been some social media posts about the bins in Netherlee being set in fire again. Is is this an increasing issue or is it um, is it not an issue at the moment as you see it? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Panther. So I'll try and uh, uh, take your questions uh, one at a time, and and, and hopefully. Uh, Maybe I don't know if Superintendent McKenzie will want to, uh, to add anything. Uh, so in terms of the domestic abuse and crime uh, to instance at a conversion rate, that's obviously something we look at on a daily basis from a, a local point of view. We review every single domestic incident that occurs in the subdivision every single morning. And what our officers will look at uh, when they go to a domestic incident is if there's enough or indeed if a victim is reporting that a crime has been occurred. So whilst I can't give you a hard and fast answer about why that, that conversion rate has went down, I think probably what we've maybe seen to a certain degree is there's a lot of stresses in people's lives just now for a variety of different reasons. A lot more people working at home, a lot of people are under financial pressures, I think we appreciate because of everything that's going on with the furlough scheme and what have you. And whilst I can't say for 100% certainty that that's maybe a part of the explanation is that we may be getting some more low level reports from couples that are reporting domestic abuse and it doesn't quite meet that threshold for a crime being recorded. But what I would give you the reassurance is that when we, we go along, we record the details to make sure that if it's appropriate, we share it with partner agencies if people can be offered additional support if and if they require that. And we obviously ask for their consent. So there's maybe an element of it. Some of the, the reports that are coming into the police don't quite hit that crime threshold, but I can give you the reassurance that every domestic crime that we do get in the area is subject to a full review uh, by a supervisor officer on the first instance and then by, by myself in the morning. And we make sure that we cover off everything in terms of initial inquiries, such as door to door inquiry and, and various other aspects when that initial call comes in. So hopefully that maybe uh, covers that one off for you. I do have some data and a separate document in relation to uh, COVID calls, which are Try and drop in a, 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 separate, a separate screen if I just when I, I get the opportunity. Anecdotally, I can uh, give you just in terms of the, it's not an exact sense in terms of how we have recorded these, we, these calls. Obviously, in relation to lockdown, our operational response from Police Scotland is known as Operation Tala. In our control rooms, it uh, will tag uh, sort of coronavirus related calls with an Operation Tala tag. But that very much comes down to the, the, the this, uh, individual controller. And it's a good measure for us. It's not exact what is it is observation I would make. So having done uh, some some work round about that in terms of quarter one, two and three, you've obviously seen from the antisocial behaviour calls, we reported a massive spike in the first quarter, which was obviously when we were into lockdown the 23rd of March. That tailed off in the second quarter. But what I have seen as, as, as we would all expect, now that the stricter restrictions, I think they get reintroduced. You've not been allowed to visit somebody in their home in East Renshaw since the 23rd of September. In quarter three, we have seen that increase again, uh, but not to the same level in the first uh, quarter. But I'll dig out that document that I've, I've prepared and I'll give you some additional context round about that potentially when uh, colleagues from the, the fire service are a delivering report, I'll, I'll send you a message on the, uh, the, uh, the team's messaging to, to, to cover that off. And finally, I see uh, Mr McGill is looking to come in, so I'll just cover off the, the Netherly wheelie bin uh, aspect very quickly, finally. So it's something that's just developed in the last couple of weeks. We've had a couple of reports of bins going missing. You'll be aware that our Police Scotland youth volunteers delivered uh, some leaflets uh, round about Netherly, and we've not seen a huge amount of that in the past couple of years, but there has been a couple of reports of thefts in the last couple of weeks and we discussed one this morning. So our community policing team at Giffnock are again uh, having a look at that and linking in with colleagues from the, uh, the fire service as and when as and when we need to. So hopefully that covers that off uh, Councillor Bamforth and I'll, I'll hand over to Superintendent McKearns if that's okay. That's good. Thanks Brian. Superintendent. Thanks very much Brian. Just to confirm, you know, the, the update Brian's given in about the domestic abuse issues is absolutely spot on, and it is, um, you know, that the both from the the PPU department, 
have to look after um, domestic abuse and from the area commanders on a day-to-day -day basis that um, these incidents are, are, are scrutinised and looked at and, and spoken about at SNP level as well. And it was just to touch on in relation to the calls for um, what, what we term as Operation Tala or the, the COVID-related calls. Um, so th these have went up um, and as, as Brian alluded to in his report that the number of calls for antisocial behaviour are obviously up. And these are calls that in normal times we wouldn't be going to, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be going to calls about kids playing football um, on a football pitch or people having, um, you know, six people into their house or their back garden. So naturally now those calls have, uh, are coming in and uh, are, are going up and we anticipate as the, the weather improves, then the open spaces will become probably more of an issue for us. And I know, you know Brian has and, he, and his team are, are working hard on about the issues up at uh, Whiteley Wind Farm um, and the other open spaces we have with the, the, the 3G pitches and uh, at the, the, the schools as well. Uh, and I know he's been speaking to um, the, the, the council about that this week as well. But that's a, it's across the board. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's in the rest of the division. It's, a, it's in the rest of the country, and every single division um, is reporting the exact same increases. Um, it, it's just the type of call that we're now being asked to go to. We previously wouldn't have, have, have been going to them. Um, and, and hopefully, as, as the vaccine rolls out, um, then things will improve in, in relation to that. Um, but it was just to give you, you know, a, a kind of an idea that this is this is not. Um, just in, in East Rand, it is absolutely across the board and across the country. Thanks for that. And I did, I did actually see John McQuilter. I'm sure you all saw in the news last week. Um, he was on the telly. Although it was hard to do, it was only because of his voice, and then they had his name up because you couldn't see because he was obviously masked. So I appreciate it. it's in other areas, but I just wondered, will there eventually be any kind of data? Um, as an aside, any other data looking at different areas to see which not not. Not so that anybody can blame any particular local authorities, but just in terms of the other local of other local authorities to see how how we were in comparison. Because I know I've had people contact me saying, you know, why why is East Renfrewshire? Uh, why do we appear to be maybe not worse than other local authorities, but but our numbers seem to be coming down a bit slower? And having asked questions around, is it because? people are meeting in each other's houses. I mean, I guess people always want to find an explanation. So it would be useful if at some point in future we had <coughs> comparisons of that, or, or maybe not comparisons, if we had that data available for other for all local authorities. Yeah, so there, there, there's no doubt at all that there, there are um, good numbers of people who are, are breaching the restrictions. Um, and and by, by far and away, it's not the, the, the majority. Um, but it, it's sufficient. It's obviously uh, impacting on the numbers locally, um, and obviously we would defer to our colleagues in, in health um, to provide more data around about that. But from our own um, perspective, yeah, we, we can see the, the number of breaches calls and the number of fixed penalty notices that we have to give out to people now, unfortunately. Um, and and hopefully Brian will have some figures that will uh, give that. We won't have the comparison with with others readily at hand just now, um, and and I'm sure we could probably try and uh, get those those figures for you to give some con context for the uh, the local authority against other local authority areas. But we'll try and look for that for you. Okay, thank you very much, Superintendent Brian. Did you you have your hand up? Is it in reply to this particular? Yeah, it was just to, to, to give a quick update, Council America, if, if I may, in terms of uh, some of the, the information that Councillor Banforth was looking for. So in advance of today's meeting, obviously, uh, Superintendent McKearns has given a bit more context on about the uh, the wider issues that we're having. So in relation to the, the tagged calls that I, I referenced, so for quarter one, we had 467 TALA tagged calls. For quarter two, we had 110, which is obviously significantly less, which obviously reflects the fact that we were moving out of lockdown. And for quarter three, it was 164. So as you can see, there's a bit of an increase, but it's not spiked to the same level uh, that we experienced during quarter one. And anecdotally, from my own experience, it can be any any night of the week that we're getting calls. To give you just some, some figures around about how things have looked for, uh, for quarter three in terms of our level of COVID enforcement, our officers have issued 46 fixed penalty notices uh, for people who were not uh, adhering uh, to, to lockdown restrictions. 
And associated with that, a number of householders will have been charged with uh, an offence which is known in, couple, in terms of couple and reckless conduct. And we have moved on a significant amount of people in relation to uh, not complying with the guidelines. But as I previously reported to the Cabinet, that's very much underneath the, the sort of four years approach that the, the Chief Constable has, has sort of adopted for the whole country. So that's just to give you a kind of an indication of maybe some hopefully some figures which are quite helpful. Uh, Councillor Bamforth, if there is anything else that can pull together in terms of comparators with other local authorities, I'll certainly see if that, that information is, is available to us. There is a, a database that our officers fill out every time they're engaged in that COVID type incident, and I'll, I'll certainly research that and come back to you. Thanks, no, thanks very much, sir. Brian. I'm going to give let Councillor Grant in now, he's been waiting patiently. Okay. Uh, just a, a few points, if I may, Chairman. Um, the, the the virus thing, uh, I'm sure that uh, when the police picked up their warrant cards many years ago, they weren't signing up for a police state, but that's kind of where we're at at the minute. Uh, no fault of anybody's, <coughs> and that's just what we've got to deal with, but it's not a happy position for anybody. What I'm concerned about is when... Um, further down the line, we start to ease up again in in situations will it all go completely haywire and then you'll be forced into situations again that you didn't really want to be part of. So it's it's just something that's very concerning about the whole scene that we're all in. We're all in it. We're, there's no exceptions. We're all in it. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very worried about the young people and their well-being because if they themselves are in situations that they could never have foreseen. And I think there's an awful lot of young people are feeling very victimised, not because of anything in particular, but they just don't know how to cope with this having been locked up and what are they going to do and they're feeling very stressed out and and I just wonder if the police are in a situation, I mean I see the campus cops are still involved but it's, it's a very very tricky situation where young people find themselves in a, a position that, that wasn't of their making, they don't want to be in, they don't know how to deal with it and I don't know if you guys have got a plan to, to self mitigate the circumstances when we do get to a position of easing up, hopefully not too long, but it's a very, very difficult, very tricky one, and I don't really don't envy you your job. And just a small point, nothing to do with that. I've had some inquiries about uh, traffic at the wee roundabout at Krupfer Road and the Air Road. I don't know whether that's a council matter or a police matter, but people complaining that folk are not bothering to go round the wee roundabout. They just fly over the top of it. So that's just a, an add-on. But I really am particularly concerned about young people and the way forward with them. Thank you. Th thanks very much, uh, Councillor Grant. I do notice, or I do note, that the campus officers have maintained contact with schools and so on and, and provided continuity and support for individuals so from a policing point of view I don't know uh, whether superintendent wants to speak or Brian wants to speak on, on some of the points that uh, Councillor Grant raised. Uh, uh, Chair, I mean, it's, a, it's a very hostile environment in which you work you know. Yeah I'm quite happy to pick up on that if that's in order so just the uh, really in terms of a uh, well your concerns around about where the police are in, in relation to coronavirus and everything else. So I think we're, we're pretty well versed as an organisation now in terms of how we're dealing with coronavirus. Yeah, as I've already touched on the 4 E's approach that we've adopted all the way through it, and it's very much been in that engagement with the public. And our officers have exercised their discretion on a good number of occasions through this, and I think that's been particularly important in terms of the legitimacy of the police service. We police by consent in Scotland, and we're very much aware that that there will be a, hopefully an end to coronavirus at some point uh, going forward. So I think as an organisation, we're, we're pretty well versed in, in how we'll come out of that. And we do publish detailed operational guidance for our officers as and when there are changes coming down from Scottish Government. So I'm quite sure uh, we will adapt as, as we have done uh, throughout the pandemic. 
In terms of young people, just to, uh, to pick up on what Councillor Merrick said there, uh, we do have the campus officers. <clears throat> the children obviously aren't in schools just now, but uh, the instruction has been that uh, whilst they're attached to our community policing teams, what they've been doing is maintaining uh, contact with all the respective head teachers to find if there's any support that we can lend in relation to specific uh, groups of children or individual children uh, that, that might be coming to their attention for whatever reason or through other mechanisms. And we've still been attending young people support groups and, and things of that nature. So our campus assault officers are still in there. So we're maintaining close links with uh, our colleagues in education. And to touch on your point about uh, young people's mental health, I think it's an extremely valid point. I think we're all uh, been affected by the COVID uh, lockdowns to some degree. And I know colleagues in education have been putting together a lot of information and in, in, in conjunction with colleagues in social work. There is a, a programme and there are online resources that young people can access to, to help them get through as, as best they can at the time being. And in terms of young people being victimised, I'll just take it back to the point I've, I've initially made. Uh, our officers are they're taking a very pragmatic approach to the calls that we get and we're ex exercising our discretion as it's when it's appropriate. We totally appreciate that young people will be young people. We're, we're all young people ourselves and, and we get the challenges with that. And I think what we're just trying to do and hopefully we're doing it correctly is, is striking that balance about when we're engaging with people, when people are reporting things to the police. Uh, and just finally, the wee roundabout at Newton Mayans, I know it well, so uh, I'm not sure what we can do to influence driver behaviour there, Councillor Grant, but I'll certainly give it a wee bit of thought and see what we can do in respect to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're on mute. You're on mute, Colm. That, those famous uh, three words for Zoom meetings. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Uh, uh, just a couple of points to make, Brian, if I may. And uh, I think it's a positive report. And, and I, I love the Herbert pro protocol, the Herbert protocol, because we've seen some real sad things on the television recently where people have gone missing and just not been able to be found. So I welcome that. And well done to the Greater Glasgow Division for rolling that out, uh, which includes yourselves, obviously. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about young people and, and how you're acting with discretion, and that's exactly what's needed. We don't live in a police state, it is by consent, but it is an extremely hostile environment in which people are, are working in. And the other point that I keep making, it's not as if the police don't have to face these individual challenges. And of the pandemic themselves, because everybody has to be locked, everybody has to stay indoors, has to be careful. So as well as providing reassurance to society on a, on a big level, you still have that daily stuff to face pandemic uh, issues uh, yourselves individually and as an organization. So well done for that. One of the weak things I did want to touch on, well, big things is crimes of dishonesty. Because we're in COVID, again, there's vultures circle at every single point where people are vulnerable. Uh, and I wonder <laughs> if there was, uh, particularly around testing and vaccinations, you know, you're getting getting phone calls offering vaccinations for like all sorts of money. But uh, are there any further plans for you to lead any campaigns to highlight the dangers of that type of fraud and things that the council could support with in that? Uh, and that's really all I have at this point for, uh, I think most of the stuff I was going to talk about, we've already heard quite well. Okay, thanks Councillor Merrick. Well, it's just, a, it's an, an absolutely valid point. So we're, we're, we're dealing with our, our young people as best we can. So I'm heartened to, to, to hear that you're, you're, you're happy and, and quite rightly so that our officers are, are exercising discretion as and when that's appropriate. You're absolutely right, our uh, officers are people as well. They're, they're dealing with, the challenges coronavirus are uh, working on a daily basis, but they still get that to, to deal with in their, their private lives. And I think uh, we're all acutely aware of that as, as managers and we're doing what we can to support our staff uh, going forward. As an organisation, there, there have been various initiatives launched in terms of wellbeing apps, uh, fitness initiatives and, and various other things just to try and uh, keep our uh, officers' mental health in the right place and, and provide that support as and when it's necessary. And obviously when things are require a more in-depth uh, intervention if that gets to that stage, then we, we absolutely take our, our staff's welfare as, uh, 
as, as being paramount. So I can give you the, the assurance that we, we absolutely do that. Uh, in terms of claims of dishonesty, probably something I've touched on the the aspect of <laughs> sort of housebreaking has been the most kind of the traditional aspect because it was highlighted in our consultation in, in the local police plan. And we've already mentioned that a couple of, of recent cabinets in terms of that fraud aspect. So probably just kind of, uh, I think we we, we all recognise that this is a, an, an emerging trend. And I think there's probably not a day goes by that I don't see somebody that unfortunately has been scammed out of, of money in some uh, shape or form. And my concern has always been that are we getting to the, the kind of hard to reach communities? We do a lot of work in social media, as you and I have discussed in the past, but are we really getting to that? that hard to reach, or those hard to reach groups. And I think there's a challenge in there. So we're exploring a few opportunities uh, through our, our Lalo Constable Petrie and, and colleagues in Trading Standards. And, and we're just looking at where are we going to get people just now? Well, we've been into supermarkets, people have had to eat through the pandemic. And as uh, Lorraine was touching on just, just at the start of the, the meeting there, vaccination centres, we're all probably going to be in one in the next few months, hopefully. So we're looking at doing some work along with uh, colleagues in health and in the council, getting some publicity materials round about there. And obviously you'll be aware that the national campaigns take five for fraud and, and what have you. So we're exploring all uh, available opportunities uh, from a, a divisional point of view, Greater Glasgow Division. I think there's a, a recognition that the, the, the fraudsters are coming up with new and innovative ways all the time. And it's really about us keeping ahead of the game. You know, we're getting people which I find quite disgusting to be honest. We are, are using the vaccine and the testing programme as a, a, a an opportunity. So we're absolutely alive to that and we're exploring all that we can do just to try and highlight and stop people becoming victims of crime in the first place. Okay, thanks very much. Well, okay, uh, and Superintendent McCurns wants. Yeah, no, again, just on that point, just to, to um, provide some further uh, reassurance around about it. So from a national perspective, uh, the Serious Crime Directorate are looking at this um, this issue. Um, and obviously there's, there's a, a rollout in relation to our cyber crime, um, which will take in this type of fraud as well. Also, uh, within the division, the partnerships, um, are, are looking at how we are engaging through social media as well and specifically looking around this, this issue of, of online fraud or um, social fraud as, as we call it as well. Um, so, so people being contacted uh, either uh, through their, their phone or um, through other some other medium that they're, they're, they're online with. So, so these are the that and actually uh, this week at uh, our own senior management team meeting, um, the divisional CID are also looking uh, at fraud specifically because we've seen an increase over the, the term of the pandemic as well. Um, so from a, a, a local uh, divisional and national perspective, this is all being looked at and, and there, you will start to see um, some rollout from that. Great, thank you very much for that. Uh, anybody for any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much for your report and you're going to stay with us through the fire report, please. Uh, okay, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Jim McNeil, who's the divisional, divisional area commander for the Tri-Council area, which is Renfrewshire, East Renfrewshire and Inverclyde. So over to yourself, thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and good morning to, to everybody. I guess it, it would be only only right of me to, to start with a, a thanks to, that I need to extend back through yourself, Lorraine, about all the, the work, and I know that Brian had touched on this, all the, the work, the, the partnership, what they were undertaking uh, in the run-up to Bonfire Night. So I wanted just to, to put on record the, the, the superb partnership working from a, a council and from a policing perspective around uh, the, the challenge around Bonfire Night, which was very, very unusual. And Councillor Grant made a, a point that can kind of struck me there, you know, a, a few comments around it's been a really, really particular time, it's been a really challenging time, it's been a very unique time. And I guess as, as I start to talk through uh, the report, I'll kind of tease some of that back out in terms of we we posture ourselves from a, a fire and rescue point of view to make sure that people see a business as usual stance. And I'm really, really proud of that, but it's what do we do? And my team's eyes are now firmly cast on how we start to come out of COVID and how we react and how we, we do more in terms of delivering those better outcomes to the, the community of, of East Ren. 
But uh, Chair, if you're okay, I'll start away with just a wee bit of background, if, if that's okay. Uh, and it's a piece of work I'll, I'll bring back to, to the Cabinet, probably for our, our next scrutiny meeting. So you know that the current local plan uh, is, is up for review. And one of the things that we're, we're uh, considering at this point is we're looking at a, a future vision strategy that's going to be an internal uh, consultation document at this time. And that's very much going to set the roadway, the pathway for where we, we find the fire and rescue service and how we, we can become more connected to the partnership processes and, and more focused around delivering on, on outcomes. So that future vision at some point along that continuum and with the, the Scottish Government election that will take place, but would naturally come off the back of that as a reviewed framework document. So the, the fire framework document itself is the minister's, it's like a, a question book. So the minister says the fire and rescue service, we want you to do X, Y, Z. So that framework document will be reviewed and therefore there'll be a brand new strategic plan. And the minute there's a brand new strategic plan looking at all the current risks, then I'll come back to, to cabinet with a, a reviewed and a, a brand new local plan that absolutely meshes into the, the needs of East Rhine and right across the, the other two parts of the area that I've got responsibility for. So I will be bringing back that uh, draft interim plan that will just allow us to bridge the, the gap between now and when the framework document, etc., will, will be brought forward. And as such, you'll look at it, and it'll be very similar to where we're at just now. It'd be wrong of us to make a start change, a, a huge deviation off that, because I still think that the risks and the things that we are focusing on is live and, and is relevant now as it was when the plan was uh, developed itself. On a, a COVID perspective, and I'll, I'll mention two or three times about the, the kind of outward facing piece to look what the, the service is looking very much as a business as usual posture. We have got a huge amount of work that's played into our staffing profile on a day to day basis to make sure that our stations are uh, fulfilled and we've got the staff and we've got the people and that the processes around how we look at self isolation cases. And I can report back into Cabinet this morning. The report we had this morning, we've got four self isolating cases, one of which was shielding across the, the area. So what we find ourselves in a, in a really, really good position, but that's not by mistake or by good grace. That's because a, a lot of the process and protocols are put in place and the, the early alert of self-isolation is a tried and tested methodology. And as such, I can also report back into Cabinet, our absence level is sitting about 4% just now. So I guess that kind of sets us back up in terms of a number of changes that may come from the, the local plan perspective, but more importantly, the, the services we deliver to the communities of, of East Ren is hopefully went unblemished. It looks as if we, we are still very much kept on the, on the front foot. And I'll, I'll give you just a, a couple of figures to, to, to further compound that if it's OK. So across the, the, the reporting period, we carried out a total of 148 home fire safety visits uh, across the, the, the Barhead and Clarkson uh, stations itself. Uh, there was 58 high risk visits carried out during that period of time. Our post-domestic incident response is where if we go to an incident, we then trap the doors of uh, opposing premises to see if we can engender a home fire safety visit, and there were 19 of them in place. Uh, we fitted 55 uh, smoke detectors and nine heat detectors across that period of time, and also we have supplied four fire resistant mats, one fire retardant bed, and two fire retardant, uh, sorry, one fire retardant blanket and two fire retardant bedding kits. To, to those people who are absolutely most uh, at risk within the, the community. So a, a huge amount of work that probably sits in, and hopefully puts the foundation forward for me to start to talk about the, uh, the, the report itself. So Chair and for colleagues in the call, it's a, an opportunity for me just to uh, introduce one of my senior team. So I brought Station Commander Scott McMillan into the call this morning and Scott's going to talk about uh, an initiative that we're, we're running with the Council and I'll, I'll bring Scott in during the uh, during the, the, the paper. Scott is a station commander for Barhead and, and Clarkson and has got a wealth of knowledge and experience and you'll, you'll know from uh, one of our, our my original meetings uh, chair, uh, I brought Scott in from working in Inverclyde into t Shrine. so let's see, I'll, I'll bring Scott into the, uh, the paper as we start to, to go through it, uh, if that's okay. Colleagues, can I just bring you on to the, the report itself and if I can just hold on the East Remshire activity uh, summary. So that's the, the, the page with uh, the, the six criteria at the, the top of it. And I'll just I'll quickly go through that. So it looks as if we've got a, quite a, a decent trajectory in terms of a 7% reduction on fires. Our events of special service, and that's predominantly around road traffic collisions, is also tracking down uh, a reduction of 4%. 
False alarms, and it's a real key thing that I'll, I'll bring Scott in, uh, because that false alarm equates to 27% of our operational activity is based on our mounted fire alarm system, and that's the initiative that I'll, I'll bring Scott back in uh, further on to the paper. Uh, our increased uh, number of total incidents, that's a composite number of incidents, went up very, very slightly. It's went up by, by 4%. Our files in, in non-fire casualties is uh, dramatically dropped by 75%, and that's you know I, I continually make reference to the economic cost of us attending unwanted fire alarm system, uh, which is probably based on a kind of human behaviour element. Is still sitting 143,810. Uh, if I just bring you on to the next page, and the page has started away with domestic safety and accidental dwelling files. And there's some real positives in there. Uh, you know, the, the, there's more to there's more to the work that goes on behind the, the scenes in terms of just looking at the, the high level outcomes we're talking about here. But what we're seeing on a on a year to year basis, we've got a 53% reduction on accidental dwelling files, and that's a figure. But there's a there's a people, there a household that sits directly behind there. And one of the things that I'm really really keen to to focus in on, I, I gave you an idea of what we're doing with the home fire safety visits and the activity that our, our teams are involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. What we're seeing is cooking is still the, the kind of primary cause. So we only had nine reported events over that quarter, but we see cooking as one of the primary uh, causes of that. But also the, the number of premises that has got an alarm and therefore has raised a detection and therefore has allowed people either to react to the fire or indeed walk out the fire is something that's quite remarkable. So what we're seeing is in, in every fire we, we attended over that period of time, detection was present. And if you, you look at the severity of the, the accidental dwelling fire, 67% required no firefighting action, 44% required no heat or smoke damage. Now, that to me is a, a really, really positive step because I say take it away from the, the, the premise point of view, but also the cost to recover that house, that household, the, the, supply, you know, the, the surrounding households is quite, quite stark. So that's testament to all the work that Scott and his team and our partners are doing across the uh, across the council in terms of getting that message and that community safety messaging uh, across everything we do. So one of the things that probably supports that greatly is our CAT team, so our community action team are continually reviewing our adults at risk, so those vulnerable people that we have got in our system. And as such, that is monitored almost in a 24-hour, a seven days a week process. And what I can report back into the Cabinet is we are one of the, the highest performing areas across Scotland and that's a bold statement but I, I make it with every bit of credibility in terms of how we manage people and the number of people we have got on the system that sits within a, a time threshold is probably either at this at the time of this report probably either the, the top one or two across Scotland and I guess that's just a, a an indication of the, the drive and the motivation that I give Scott and the, the team on a day-to-day a -day basis. A consequence of domestic fire safety, there was a couple of campaigns you'll have seen run on the, on the TV. So the Make the Call campaign and also our winter safety campaign. And that's just about highlighting the, the people who are potentially at risk, the, 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 you know, that risk profile of somebody over 50 living alone. And that has really played testament back into probably educating people at a point in time where we've got a lot of people living at home and a lot of people working at home. So again, that, that community safety message is, is underscored again in every every single thing that we that we do. If I just bring us on to uh, domestic safety, and again, a, an absolute correlation back uh, to the domestic fires itself. Over the reporting period, with only one a person who was identified as been a fire casualty, and as such, delighted to report that that person had had slight uh, injuries, so slight smoke inhalation. So again, what we're seeing is in terms of severity and that early intervention where, where people are being alerted earlier, that's given them the opportunity to react to, to the fire. And again, we're, we've come through that period without any, any severe uh, injuries reported uh, based on domestic fires itself. Just bring you over to the top of the next page, uh, Cabinet, please. Unintentional uh, injury and harm. So this is the... This is the kind of criteria we look at from a, a kind of broader perspective, away from what you would normally deem as a paradigm of fire. And what I can report, there was two minor road traffic collisions across the, the, the reporting period, and again, two individuals with minor injuries at that time. But I'm going to caveat that, if that's OK, eh, Chair. This is something that I have challenged Scott and the team and the rest of the management team because there is something more I feel that the fire and rescue service can do in terms of delivering that uh, early support 
So if you look at the, the number of times where we, we go to assist in breaking down a door for the ambulance service, the number of times that we could potentially use some of our skills to help those people who are absolutely most at, at risk. So I've asked uh, both Alan Cochrane, who's my group commander, and Scott, to think about how we can be more connected back in to making sure that our resources are there, ready to deploy for those people who are who are kind of struggling a wee bit. And that may, you know, that eventually that may fall into the, the medical response. So I know previously uh, colleagues would have, uh, you know, chatted this through at a council level about the, the role map and the, the widening out of the, the role map of a firefighter. And that absolutely intrinsically was going to link back into out of hospital cardiac arrest and trauma care. So there's something more that I'm looking to push on the unintentional injury and harm piece. And again, we'll, we'll scope out some ideas in terms of, you know, we touched on there, Brian mentioned there about is there something we could do not just from a, a home safety and a fire education piece, is there something we can do around fraud, is there something we could do jointly around there? But that's something I'll tie back in with, uh, with Joe, police colleagues and, and colleagues from uh, across the council itself. If I just bring you over again to deliberate fire setting, uh, so this is the, the, the one, uh, and I think it was uh, Councillor Banforth that asked about the kind of narrow lean. I'll bring uh, Scott in just in a wee minute. But this is uh, one of the things where we're still seeing a, a kind of downward trajectory. It's only a 6% reduction. But if I, I again, if I can just put this into a wee bit of context, this fell right over the, the top of the, the bonfire night. And our biggest activity, if you look down towards the, the, the right hand side of that, that paper, our biggest activity was around a uh, secondary fire, which was the either grass fire or indeed uh, bonfires. So I'll, can you hold on there? Scott, is there anything you just want to come back in just based on deliberate fire setting, specifically around Netherly? And uh, any thoughts just around bonfire from your, your own perspective? Yeah, the Nether Lee, uh, the spate of bonfires, Nether Lee, that was uh, Malelo, John Paul, he's highlighted that too, and he continues to report into the Greater Results and Partnership, partnership, partnership Meeting. And early Lee, he's responsible for uh, identifying any detentions and passing over information. And through that partnership, we've highlighted to increase patrols through the wardens and also uh, policing. Uh, within the kind of high tariff areas. Uh, with regards to the bonfire, our strategy, uh, obviously we've got the COVID uh, restrictions and the limitations we have by engaging directly with, with, with schools across the local authority. Uh, our community action team put together a five point, a five point engagement plan, uh, an educational plan, and that consisted of uh, presentations, uh, detailed lesson plans, hard hitting videos uh, that covered both age groups, both in secondary and primary schools, and also links to Go Safe Scotland. Uh, the, the feedback we had from all our partners within the education was, was positive uh, and it was well received. Yeah, thanks very much, Scott. I and mean, I, I guess uh, Councillor Bamford, more than happy to, to touch on that just as we get to the end of the report, but just to, to give you the comfort that it's something the, the, the local team review almost on a, on a day to day basis and, and react as quickly as we possibly can. So thanks for that, Scott. Uh, if I just bring us back on to the non domestic fire safety, Ted, at the, the, the next part of the, uh, the report. So what you'll see there is again quite a, a significant uh, reduction, but that is absolutely typical of you know business premises not uh, opening up. This is absolutely a, a criteria that could be wrapped up around uh, all COVID protocols. But in saying that, there was only three events, which uh, again we're talking relatively small small numbers. There was no fire damage, and there was one uh, one deliberate and two accidental activations of uh, of fires located within. Uh, commercial premises. One of the things I'd also like to probably just give the, the, the cabinet a wee bit of comfort around, uh, we have got a, a fire safety enforcement section that, that bridges across the three local authority areas and our fire safety team is headed up by Group Commander David McCarry and we have started doing virtual audits and we have started at the, the start of COVID. So the ability for us to, to come back in to, to look at those high risk premises based on the Fire Scotland Act we're undertaking that through virtual uh, a virtual audit process and a, and a platform that allows us to speak with a, a with the responsible person to identify and also to, to highlight any areas of risk. So that's something that, that's upstanding and will continue to, to run because we, we physically can't go out and, and meet these premises. Uh, can you head on? And the the final page just before I, I bring Scott back in is uh, is unwanted fire alarm signals. So I've I've spoke previously at, at Cabinet around some of the, the work that's been undertaken, some of the national work that has been undertaken in terms of how do we address 
the, the demand or how do we take the demand out of the, the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service around our attendance at unwanted fire alarm uh, signals. So uh, to me, this is more about the, the £148,000 of economic cost. It's the, the ability where we have got two stations that are perfectly located within uh, within Ishrin. And the minute that one of those appliances move out to go and deal with something that's totally and utterly foreseeable, the jigsaw moves around the area. And what you may find is that we have got the two pumps out at uh, an unwanted fire alarm signal, and then we've got a person's reported fire that comes back in. And we are tied in to, to that event. And as such, we've now got pumps that will come from uh, Pollock and Govan and Paisley, etc. So to me, my motivation is about the, the reduction in the road risk. So taking the appliances off the road, driving at speed, the ability to scale back the predetermined attendance to some premises, and more importantly, the ability to hold our posture in case we need to deploy back into the communities where people are genuinely uh, needing our, our services. So as I mentioned previously, it takes up probably 27% of our operational activity is based on unwanted fire alarm signals. And you, you're seeing that the people there are unwanted fire alarm signals that can the top five premises, education, primary schools, secondary schools, residential uh, homes, uh, nursing homes, retail and other residential stroke shelters. So that's the kind of top criteria that we look at. And uh, it's a, a perfect opportunity just to, to bring Scott back in to identify the work we're doing to address that top five in conjunction with, uh, with the council. So Scott, if you could just cover the, the take five initiative for us, please. Yep, thanks, Jim. Uh, pleased to announce that we've recently launched the, the Take 5 UFAS pilot programme. Uh, we launched this on the 1st of February and that's exclusive uh, to East Renfrewshire. Uh, we designed kind of planning this project around 2019 and this was done in partnership with our colleagues from East Renfrewshire Council, the Assets Management and Property Management team. And together we looked at the common causes of UFAS incidents across uh, the local authority uh, kind of run property. Uh, the project was due to launch in March 2020 and obviously we've, we've had to push that back because of uh, the COVID restrictions and uh, com competing priorities. Uh, but together this partnership we created a version of Take 5 and this is a visual poster and education initiative and it's aimed at reducing the number of false fire alarms and highlights that 98% are unwanted and avoidable. The Take 5 covers kind of five points, the T's for testing, uh, the A's for aerosol use, using the well-ventilated areas, knowledge, ensure you've completed your fire fire awareness training, uh, know how know who's responsible to test it, operate it, and equipment, know what it detects, and five uh, stands for take time to think about your actions. Sitting underneath the, the headings is about 15 uh, key points that, that that, that covered all the educational aspects of the Take 5. Uh, initially, the programme it will target all council run and educational premises where all operational crews, when attending a UFAS incident, they'll engage and educate staff. They'll highlight the importance of Take 5 and the negative impact it has on safety due to uh, increased blue light journeys, reducing resources within the community. The fi financial impact uh, for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and East Strangers Council. The impact it has in productivity time uh, for East Strangers customers and staff, and also the impact it has in student teacher uh, and education time. Uh, again, this is supported by crews. They'll issue visible Take 5 posters and they'll be asked to, to be displayed in uh, common staff areas throughout the property. Uh, we're also working closely with East Dremshire Corporate and Community Services Department uh, to have a more kind of formal launch once the COVID restrictions are lifted. And we've also produced a short animated presentation video that can be hosted on the internet and information iHub uh, across the local authority. And that will allow all staff to be able to uh, be educated, educated on the issues around uh, UFAS. Uh, and then we'll analyse the results, then we'll look at do we have to review any aspects of the Take 5 and then we'll look at launching it across all commercial and office premises across East Renfrewshire. Uh, the Take 5 project has got a, a proven track record. It was initially launched in 2017. It was an NHS project uh, and, it, and it proved and it's seen uh, reductions of 25% and that was over a 12-month period. And if we take the economic cost and the benefits, that's, that's significant. And we're hoping to, to have the, a similar 
uh, reduction across, across the local authority. Yeah, thanks very much, Scott. And just to, to add back in there from an education point of view, uh, I mean, everybody that's on the, the call this morning will watch closely the, the you know, the, the education gap that we'll start to see taking place and uh, the amount of possibly time that has to be put back into a, a young person's education life to try and bring them back <laughs> up to where they should be. That kind of four month gap that was kind of spoken about is where they, they deem COVID has impacted in the, in the kids. And I, I think if we can get ourselves in a position where we, we don't disrupt our primary and secondary schools as much as we possibly can, uh, then that helps the, the, the probably the attainment. So that disruption piece has, has been removed. But one of the things that I would just give you comfort on uh, for everybody in the call, we will never not mobilise out to a life risk. So the things we're talking about is stuff where we can do something, that ability just to hold, is there something else we can do? But where there's a life risk, you will get the full weight of attack of our appliances from uh, from not just East Rhine, but from right across uh, my own area and some of my, my sister partner areas as well. And Chair, that concludes the uh, the quarter three report. Uh, I'm more than happy for uh, for any questions or any points. Thank you. Great. Th thanks very much, Jim and Scott. Uh, again, a very informative and full report, and always that theme of prevention, preventative strategies, uh, partnership working, and the other theme is continually continuous improvement all the time and, and innovative thinking. So thank you very much for the report and we look forward to the launches of, of uh, and information that comes out post COVID. We all look forward to post COVID any, anyway at some point. But uh, thanks very much for that. And I'll now open it up for questions. And I see Councillor Grant has a hand up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, once again, a very well laid out report. It's nice and easy to read, and uh, unlike the police one where I need my spyglass to read it, but never mind. Um, thank you for that. Uh, what I'm, I'm concerned about is the deliberate fire setting in my ward, uh, Newton Mern South. I, 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 I'm at a loss to know why there should be such a large amount of deliberate fire setting. Is it to do with the schools or, or what, what, what's it all about? Yeah, Chair, I'll come in and I'll, I'll bring Scott in. Uh, Councillor Grant, as I probably picked up on the on the report, that's something we look at very, very closely and almost at a forensic level. Every time we start to see a trend or something identifying out, it's a, it's probably a blend of a, of a number of things, uh, and it's probably not just around schools. To be honest with you, uh, it's you know one of the one of the things that I picked up on previously uh, was trying to get the like, age profile of people who were involved in and in you know the, the development or the actual the, the starting of secondary fires, and it's people up in their their forties and fifties that are predominantly the, the ones that are, are doing it. So it's not just a, a school thing, but we are doing absolutely everything we can, and we'll continue to do everything we can in terms of working with uh, the young people through our education reach back, but also that close liaison back in with Brian and, and Joe in terms of is there you know is there element, anything we can do in terms of crime or how we, we address the the elements of deliberate fire setting itself. But it's one of the things, unfortunately, or a preventative agenda. That is that is an area of of gap that I, I currently see within the, the the service because we just don't know where these things will pop up. We, we're very much on the on the, the agile thinking in terms of enlightening our feet and jumping in and reacting to that as quickly as we can. Uh, but I'll bring Scott back in. Just anything particular, Scott, just around uh, Councillor Grant's uh, point uh, that you want to just add in. No, uh, Councillor Grant, but currently I, I know. Prior to taking up my post on the on the first of the first of uh, December uh, as station commander for for East Renfrewshire, uh, one of our projects we are currently working on with the community action team is uh, we've currently got a kind of service uh, presentation and engagement strategy for fire related antisocial behaviour, and one of the and the team had been previously working on producing an interactive version where we can present that over uh, throughout the pandemic and through the restrictions that we can currently pre present that to our schools through uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, I can certainly get you an update of where we are with that uh, and how that's progressing. 
uh, but certainly it, is, it does focus part of our educational programme that targets uh, various different age groups throughout the school. We highlight the, the dangers associated with uh, the fire-related antisocial behaviour, which covers your deliberate fire setting. It, it's, it's a worry, gentlemen, that it's not just uh, daft school kids. Do you know what I mean? Older people doing deliberate fires, you know, what, what's going on in their mind? Is it just a ploy to get some attention? Is it uh, uh, trying to take somebody's attention in one direction while they're up to no good in another? It, it, fire is such a, such a dangerous thing, and, and I just can't get my head around how many deliberate fires there seems to be. And as I say, it's not just silly kids. Yeah. Chair, can I come back in just to, to cover the, the, the last week point on that, if, it, if it's OK? So, Councillor Gallant, I, I, I totally and utterly agree with everything you, yeah, you said there. And, and I guess the, if you, you take nothing away from how, how areas business is done, that's the that's the challenge I'm playing back into both Alan and, and Scott and our, our crews across both, uh, both stations. But this reporting period also identified it was bond family and the, the, the challenges we, we probably see can artificially because we, we didn't have the, the kind of organised events as such, what was happening is people were then having more of a, a kind of localised events, and these events were popping up all over the place, to be honest with you. So it, it's one of the things we'll continue to look as we, we step away from looking into quarter three and looking into quarter four, but the comfort I'll give you is we will be doing everything in our power to make sure that trajectory is now maintained. And I just, I would like to think that, that was a, a blip in terms of just bonfire night. That has probably pushed out the figures we've bit artificially high for us uh, for that reporting period. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, Jim Scott and Councillor Grant. Uh, Councillor Bamforth. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, can I just uh, thank you and your CAT team, um, James, for all the work you're, you do with the HSCP um, in terms of our vulnerable residents, because that is, as you've mentioned, it's so valuable in terms of, you know, the prevention of slips, trips, falls and fires and all sorts. So, yeah, that's absolutely appreciated the collaborative work you do with that. Personally, I would like to thank you. I think I mentioned the police and fire cabinet last time. But I think my figures included in this when some kids set fire to um, some what they were doing locally here and they did it about six feet from my back garden um, at the back of Kirkhill House, the lane, taken inside of bins from local shops and things and filling them um, at the back of our house anyway, it was filling it with twigs and setting it on fire and it was really quite scary. But I'm sure that is, um, and I know I was told at the time that that, that, that was quite common that, that this was happening, you know, not common, that's the wrong word. It, it happened a few times, but I'm sure that's something you'll cover in your take five with the school ch children anyway. But uh, what I wanted to really ask you about, I mean, I know it's hard and we've spoken about it before, and I think Councillor Grant mentioned it, about getting actual figures rather than percentages because, and you have done that, because obviously percentages can look quite uh, quite stark and, and quite worrying when actually we're in absolute numbers, it's quite low. But I noticed it, which was good, that the unwanted fire alarms um, had gone down 20%. Um, I would have expected that to be lower, considering we've been <laughs> in East Renfrewshire anyway and, and, and severe lockdown since the 23rd of September. And I noticed 38% of those are in schools. Now, I understand all the work you're doing in schools, absolutely, and I understand these are not high absolute numbers but I just wondered if that's maybe given a disproportionate um, impression so of those 38 percent in schools are some of those um do you keep a record of which ones are say people deliberately setting fires or well, not setting fires deliberately setting off the fire alarms or are some of those very appropriate in terms of say home economics classes or or you know we are although they're unwanted in the general term in, in the general scheme of things are some of them really um, not not deliberate as such, but just things that happen in the course of, of a school day, as opposed to um, unwanted and deliberately set off? If you get my gist. Yeah, Councillor Bamford, that, that's a that's a great a great question. So a, a couple of things wrapped up in there. 
Uh, we we can and I'll, I'll maybe I'll maybe ask Scott to if we look at uh, providing that in terms of it we we think is a, a malicious call so that that is something we would code as a one one so we'll, we've got the evidence in terms of how you disaggregate that from what is a code one 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 which is a malicious call or what indeed is a code one two which is a a, a call with good intent but if I, I bring it back onto the the, the schools that there, there, there are various factors in there so it could be it could be human behaviour it could be the wrong type of smoke detector. It could be a, a detector that picks up on, on dust and if there's any work going on within the, the, the school, then that dust replicates what smoke looks like. So to me, it's the, the ability to get in behind of, you know, of the figures and then start that education piece that Take 5 will do to, to say, you know, that, that should be a heat detector rather than a smoke detector because your, your home economics, the, the, the fumes that will come off the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the product that the kiddies are cooking could potentially set that smoke detector off. But for me, it's very much, you know, it's probably just a, a, a risk and evaluation process and a gap analysis that needs to be done in terms of that's the wrong type of head. And it could be something as simple as just swapping the head over. It could be something as simple as moving a, a break glass call point to a slightly different part of the building. It's covered by CCTV. So when the kids walk by, they don't just give it a wee done. But that to me is the, is the ability to reach in behind and work with, with the schools and, and work with the council and look with it and work closely with the the premise occupier to identify right so what is causing us the, the issue how many times are we here and more importantly see just that we slight amendment or evaluation if you're, you're going to work in this area you know put a bag over your smoke detector you know don't cause dust because that's when you, you see the, the the events probably kicking off so there, there's multiple threads running through there councillor bamford that we can a we can disaggregate out but more importantly we need to get behind the scenes and have that one-to-one -one dialogue with the, the premise occupier and and identifying exactly where the where the issues are, but if we if we could crack the number a youth ass, we, we'd be doing superbly well. But that again, that's the that's the, the drive and the challenge that I've given to to Scott and and Alan around to take five. It's the first time we've run it as an area, and we're looking very much to, to use this as a pilot in East Ren, and then that will be applied across other two local authority areas. And I agree with Scott, and I think that take five is just the ability just to, to hold, put your foot on top of the ball and identify what's causing us the problem here. And more importantly, if you know what the problem is, how do we put the solution in place? And it could be a relatively cheap thing. So in terms of an equipment point of view, but the big thing for me is about behaviour as well. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much for that, Jim. And it, of course it is that once you know what, once you fully know what the problem is, then you can start looking for solutions, so to speak, you know. Very often in the past, we used to see people jumping in with solutions for the new, for the problem, to solve something that isn't actually the problem. But but thanks for that. That's reassuring as well. And thanks for your report. I don't think anybody else has any other questions. So I just wanted to touch on something, if I may. OK, we're moving into this, uh, where it will soon be the law for people to have multiple detectors. You know, talking about smoke, heat, carbon monoxide. I nearly said carbon dioxide, but that's a bigger problem. Uh, so so uh, those three, uh, how does, what about in relation to care homes uh, or other types of sheltered housing? Are, are you guys going to be inspecting these premises and recommending, I, I guess, I guess the, the fire service will be involved because there's alarms involved and the fire service knows everything about alarms apparently. But, uh, so I don't, I don't know how you, what role you will have in that yeah. and, and this because that seems like a massive uh, yeah. ambitious plan to... Uh, no, that is true. And what, the, the first time I came across that was probably about three or four years ago. So that was the first time I heard that the legislation was going to come in to look at, and I'll, I'll touch on domestic and then I'll touch on commercial. But the, the ability, think about the, the workload and we can you joke prior to the, 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 the cabinet coming on, uh, coming on to the start about we go out normally and we fit these, you know, 10 year smoke detect detections as part of our home fire safety visit. The, the new alarm system, that are going to be in place will be they'll have to be linked through bluetooth and the, the amount of work that's going to be involved in that will be very very significant as you can imagine mm -hmm. that's how the, the, the legislation has been pushed a year down the, the road so we've already committed there's a bit uh, let me think i think it was about three quarters of a million pounds in, in equipment that we have bought and that's these new new type of smoke and, and heat and and other type of detectors that we've got in the service but the ability for us to then deploy and make sure we can we can put these across all the, the domestic premises 
are those people who are most vulnerable within the domestic premises is a huge undertaking. There is a, a task group uh, working on the, the feasibility and the, the methodology we will apply to, to, to do that as we start to you know, look into the, the start of next, next year, 2022. But from a, a commercial and a, a kind of non-domestic viewpoint, there is legislation that will that will drive the the residents or the, the householder, sorry, sorry, the the premise occupier to fit the new level of, of detection. And as such, under the Fire Scotland Act, we have the the right and autonomy to come back in and inspect that that it sits at the correct level and the correct standards. And we will catch that as part of our ongoing audit process. So that will give you comfort, uh, Chair, that we are we will absolutely be focused in. And, and delivering on that, and we will be supporting and guiding and, and advising uh, those premises who will require that heightened level of detection. And you, you may find that it's just it's a bolt on to the current detection system that they currently have, or you may find that it's maybe more of a, a cost wrapped up with, with maybe a, a new upgraded detection system that incorp incorporates all the, the new levels of uh, detection that's required by that legislation. Scott, yeah. was there anything else? I know Scott. Scott worked in, in you know, in a, in a previous role. Scott was my PNP deputy, uh, prevention and protection. Scott, was there anything just to, to add on that? No, I think you pretty much covered most of it there. Uh, well, again, I'll revert back to the community action team. Uh, we are currently undergoing training just now on supplying uh, the new systems. We currently have a stock of several hundred uh, uh, tech equipers ready to go. Uh, when the new legislation is implemented. So currently we are we are undergoing training uh, through our staff of how, how we fit them, uh, what premises and what auspice we will fit them under. We, I don't think we're going to be fitting them to every, every it will be to high risk premises uh, initially. Uh, so just our, our, our teams are currently going through training for that uh, uh, as we speak. Yeah. Okay, yeah. th th thanks for that. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, Chair, one of the things I'll bring back to you, we've got a, we've got a more composite sit rep in terms of where we, we sit with that time scales, and uh, that's something I'll, I'll bring back to the, the next cabinet if you're okay with that, so we can give you a bit something yeah, right. a bit more uh, bit more firmed up. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I know domestic dwellings are going to have to take a brand new lead from the, from the electricity box, so it's totally independent of all the other... Uh, Circuits in the house and, and so on. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of tracking up walls and old houses and stuff, you know. I think. But thanks very much for that. Thanks very much for your report. With no other questions, I don't see any. Okay. All right. If we can move on to any other business, and this is to say cheerio to Brian. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to thank Brian for his commitment to East Renfrewshire area over the years, both as a community policing inspector and more recently as the area commander. And the focus on your support of partnership working has been an immense help as Police Scotland and East Renfrewshire Council and the communities have moved through a, a lot of challenging areas and events. Yeah. So I think you have left behind that uh, concept of partnership working the partnership has been strengthened by your work brian and uh, we will miss you and thanks very much for everything you've done over the years and all the very best for the future we wish you every success and maybe as uh, councillor banford said earlier we saw the previous area commander on the telly not that long ago <laughs> it was interesting to see but, th but thanks very much for everything you've done and good luck for the future no thanks very much for Thoroughly enjoyed my time in East Renfrewshire. As a, a lot of you know, I, I stay local in the area, so I've definitely have vested interest in what goes on here. So I'll leave my wee bit of a heavy heart, but the, the new opportunity at professional standards was just uh, was too good to pass up. So no, thanks very much for all your support and assistance over the years. It's been very much appreciated, and I wish you all the best. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Councillor Buchanan want, would like a word, please. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks for that. And thanks very much. And best wishes, Brian, uh, in your new role. And thanks for everything you've done across the area. I think it's testament. We, we see this morning the, the, the two reports that we have, which are, are generally very positive reports. And I think that's down to the dedicated work uh, that goes in across all of our services across uh, East Renfrewshire and, and indeed the partnership working that has very much been established over several years. 
And I think that stands us in good stead across the area. So thanks for everything you've done. And thanks to everyone this morning, to, to Brian, Joe, James and Scott, uh, for all of the hard work and dedication that you show uh, to the public across East Renfrewshire. So thank you very much for that. And uh, just on a, a, a funny wee note, just before we end, uh, I know that it's minus whatever it's said here, even in East Renfrewshire. Uh, I, I, got, I picked up a tweet from Scottish Fire and Rescue Service this morning to say that there's a could be a danger of fires fire, fire. Over, over the Western Isles, like there was after, and oof, which seemed unbelievable, but it did happen after the beast from the east. So. Chair, you have absolutely nailed it. I, 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 I read the I read the email I got yesterday twice. So there's a there's a high risk of forest fires and grass fires at this present time, but and you set that against the backdrop of minus seventeen. But that that's exactly what happened with the beast and east, as you mentioned. We did get a spate of uh, grass and, and forest fires. So that it's just something that's absolutely crazy. I just I mean I said to read the, the email two or three times yesterday going, this this must be sent an error, but it's it's right enough. Out of the yeah. ice into the fire. Okay. Yep. Well, good luck anyway, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in another quarter or, or before that. Okay, thanks everybody. And Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, 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 thanks all. Thanks. 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 Thanks.